we're just going to hang out here for a few minutes and let people jump on and make sure all of our technical our technical stuff is working properly very good we go for launch excellent wonderful wonderful well we are still technically a couple minutes early according to my watch which is really not to be held to much accountability but well you're doing better me than me because i am not wearing a watch right now oh right. my watch is broken oh that's too bad i don't know what happened there the battery died oh that's a sad story all right we are live and we can that's start wonderful. anytime you are ready well i was gonna wait just a couple of minutes because i know um there might be some people jumping on live, but uh, for those of you who are just jumping on and um, getting this, we're going to have this as a recording. We're going to break it up into three different sections. So if you are not able to sit and watch the entire hour, we totally understand. But if you are, that's wonderful. Join us, um, comment, say hi. And unfortunately, we can't say hi right now because we're um, not in front of a computer. But um, but yeah, we would love to say hi to everyone in Facebook land. So, uh, would you like to start off in prayer? Yes, I would. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you, Father, for this opportunity to teach your word. Thank you for the opportunity to minister to these folks and for giving them the time and opportunity to share this time with us. Thank you for the anointing that is on this ministry. Thank you for the opportunity to use these facilities at Mount Hope Church Williamston, a fine local church if you don't already have one. And thank you most of all for your Son and your Holy Spirit. Thank you for all these things. We receive them. We receive your wisdom. We receive your understanding. And we receive the words to say tonight in the name of Jesus. And may the hearers hear them and have hearts to hear, uh, ears to hear, eyes to see, and hearts to understand your word. And we thank you for all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Good stuff. So if you did not know, we are going to be teaching on faith tonight, which is one of our favorite topics. It seems to be one of those topics that is just inexhaustible. There's just so much about faith to learn and to know and to live and to grow by. And quite frankly, that was what came up, uh, came up in my spirit when um, we were actually on vacation. And we just were, were talking about ministry and uh what God's vision was for our ministry and what we were going to be doing and just what was ahead of us. And uh, God gave me this vision of being in, in, a, in a boat or essentially a life raft and being in a large body of water and that we for a very long time as a ministry have just been in this, this life raft and going from, I don't know, not even, I don't want to say location to location, just being around. And we had a certain amount of rations, and we had a certain amount of, uh, of people amidst us. But God has given us a destination now. And it's very exciting because now we have a place to go. And uh, he, he just gave me this entire vision and just downloaded inside of me as this complete understanding. And my first question was, how are we going to do this? And the answer was just a very simple, very clear, by faith. Everything by faith. You live by faith. You learn by faith. You, you do everything in your life by faith. So Bryce and I got into the word of God, and we started, started essentially in Hebrews 11.1. 1, you know, we've got to know what about faith. So... Um, so we're very excited to, to bring this to you, Everything by Faith, and today especially we're going to be starting, um, we have a few foundational scriptures, if you want to write them down, I'll, I'll give them to you in advance, and then as we get to them you'll know where they're at. We're going to be touching on Mark 11, 23 and 24, Matthew 21, verses 21 and 22, Luke 6, 46 through 49, James 1, verses 23, 22 through 24, and of course Hebrews 11, 1, and all of Hebrews 11. Um, so yeah, I think we can start off with what faith is. Well, let's go to Hebrews 11 so we can find out what faith is. Yes, Hebrews 11. You may have heard, uh, if you've been in church or studied the Bible for any period of time, 
that Hebrews 11 is known as the Hall of Faith. It uh, lists a great number of people who we find in the Old Testament, their accomplishments, and how those came to pass. But it starts off introducing the chapter with verse 1, which reads, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Mm -hmm. And that really is what faith is. It's a substance. It's a spiritual substance. It is the stuff out of which everything is made. Uh, as if we go on and read in verse 3, it says, Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. So people often talk about how uh, the world and the universe, everything in it was made of nothing by God. No, that is incorrect. It was actually made from faith. Mm -hmm. And then the word was added to it. Yeah, which is why um, being made in his creation, we can faith something into existence. It sounds a little out there, uh, but really faith is a substance. The word says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for. You were in a class uh, one time early in your, your education with seminary, and a professor asked the class, what is faith? And of course, everybody jumped in and said, well, now faith is. So, and they, they knew to rattle that off. And he said, no, now I, I, don't, I don't know that he corrected everybody, but what was his answer? He was an expert in the Hebrew language. And he said that our word faith is taken from a Hebrew word, uh, I believe it's pronounced emunah, and it's from, from which we get the word amen that we say at the end of our prayers. Uh, and that's not just a tagline we throw on the end of our prayers. That's a way of us saying, let it be firmly established. Mm -hmm. And what emunah means, it is the quality of having steadfastness. Mm -hmm. It's the quality of not being moved. So when one has faith, they're not moved. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's what has tangibility and substance. So if we go back to Genesis 1, if we go back and look at the beginning of the Bible, we can see this used. And no, we are not going to preach the whole thing. <laughs> yeah, whenever, whenever a, a preacher says, well, turn to Genesis 1, you have this, this thought of, oh, no, they're going to preach the whole Bible. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're just going to start at the very, very beginning. Uh, chapter 1, verse 1 of Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heaven and earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Another way this could be translated is the Spirit of God brooded upon the waters, like uh, a mother hen would brood over her, her eggs and her chicks. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And we read this in the King James Version. It sounds very passive, as if he's uh, some foppish English king saying, let there be light. <laughs> very, very passive. But no, in the Hebrew, it actually comes across more direct and more assertive. He says, light be. He's declaring light into being with his word. And what he's speaking to is faith, which is without form and void. Not meaning it's empty and chaotic, but that it's a raw substance that does not yet have form put to it. It is not yet in order. Right. I have sometimes spoken of this as... Uh, Faith being like stem cells. They are essentially a blank slate from which everything <laughs> else could be made in the human body. It just needs uh, structure or order put to it by DNA, which would be the word. Hmm. And uh, without going too deep in what to what the word word means, uh, in Greek, word is logos. And that idea is something that gives something structure or order. Uh, word and thing can sometimes be interchangeable. A word is a declaration or command that gets things in line. Like when a teacher to a group of first graders says, line up, <laughs> they get in line and get in order. That's the word she gives them. And that's what God was doing here in Genesis 1 by saying, light be. He was giving structure and order to the faith that was awaiting his command. The spirit was brooding over that. And then the spirit brought that into form and order through the spoken word from God. You see, that's, that's something that... You know, reading the English, I don't care what translation, reading the English that you would not have gotten. And so I always love language studies when you can find what the root word, either in, in Greek or Hebrew, what that root word means because it just brings the word of God to life. It just makes it full color and, and three-dimensional, and there's suddenly so much more to it. It's not just 
uh, you know, the children's storybook version, which is great for children, but there's just so much more richness to it. And when it comes to when it comes to studying out faith, which I will say has been, I have heard it often, uh, very complexly described and you know, just a very thick topic, and it's not something that has been simplified. But you know, the the word of God is is simple enough that a child can grasp. I mean, our children very often will will come up with something that's just so profound and it's so simple because it's that childlike faith, that childlike understanding, and they're able to just grasp something that adults just <laughs> hem and haw and mull and chew over and make it so thick and you're you just get to a point where you're like, oh I don't even want to, I don't even want to think about it. And and when you can study out the word, you can understand that, oh, there's so much more to it. There's, uh, there's multiple layers and facets to it. Um, something that I had heard, and I, I'll be honest, I, I don't know where I heard this. Uh, I think I heard it from you. But you had talked about faith and hope being working together uh, because faith is a, stub, a substance of things hoped for. And so they work together. And... The analogy that I heard is hope is like an anchor that you would throw out onto shore, let's say. Uh, it's where you want to be. You would throw your anchor of hope to a destination. And that anchor is hopefully attached to a chain. And then you pull on that chain, and that chain is faith. And you have that anchor established in a place that you are that you are able to to determine and to see and you know where it is and then you've got your chain which is faith and you pull on that and then your your ship your your boat whatever you're in is able to then be pulled nearer to that that hope that thing that you're hoping for and um, one of the things I thought was really interesting too when we were studying this out together is years ago I when I was learning sign language I learned the sign for hope, and I learned the sign for ex expect, and they're very similar. Now, from time to time, signs will change a little bit, and they're also different from region to region. So if you know ASL and you're like, wait a minute, no, they're not, <laughs> then uh, the way that I had learned it was that hope and expect are the same, and you're just changing your facial expressions. But I thought, wow, hope and expect are, are so similar that when you have faith in something, it's not just that you're hoping, as in many people would say, wishing or dreaming. Oh, I'm hoping. I don't know. Let's keep our fingers crossed. No, you have an expect, an expectation, an expected end that where you threw that anchor, when you pull on faith, your vessel is going to be where that anchor is because that's the two are attached. You can't help but get there. There's a destination there. Without getting too far ahead of ourselves, I think it is worth saying that an anchor also holds you into place, and that faith keeps you attached to that. When storms arise, when storms come, come against you, which they will if you, if you believe in Jesus Christ and you're trying to do things for God, storms will come against you. There will be attacks. The key thing to remember is to not be moved off that for which you hope if god has given you a picture of something that's in your future if he's called you to do something he gives you that picture of that something for you to see your faith will then hold you to that and from that faith you pull yourself or you build upon or hold yourself to that hope with the help of the word mm -hmm. so there's and an attachment Yes, that's, that's the steadfastness. That's the immovability. Yeah. Uh, many years ago, actually not many years ago, it wasn't that long ago, but for many years I felt like I was pushed around quite a bit uh, in my opinions and my beliefs. I would uh, catch hold of something, which is what the word believe means. Uh, to leave, L-I-E-V-E, -E, it's an old English word that we don't use much anymore. It means to hold something dear. So when you're told to believe, you're being commanded to take hold of something and hold it dear in your heart or our spirit, as the case may be. Yeah. But I would believe things, and then somebody else who would come along who I respect or would honor and, and value their, their thoughts and, and ideas, and then they would say something contrary to that, or they would challenge that, and then I would have to stop and think, well, do I really believe this? Yeah. And 
often I felt like I would get pushed around because I tend to defer to authority and people who are learned, and I respect people's education and, and their, their learning. Yeah. So I went to the Lord with this, and I said, well, how do, how do I stand up in ministry and speak from this word and give people what you're telling me without having somebody stand up and contradict me? You know, you think that wouldn't happen in a church setting, but it does. <laughs> you may never experience it, but, oh, we've seen some stuff. <laughs> some stuff. <laughs> so how does one hold fast and, and stand still when, when pressure comes? Well, he spoke to me, and he said, and this is not some wild revelation. You can support this by the word. If you stand on the word of God, no one will be able to push you around. That's right. Once you have a word from God, and you confess that with your mouth, and you believe that with your heart, in other words, taking it in and connecting it with that faith, then you're not going to be pushed around. You're going to be rooted and grounded, and you're going to do what God told you to do. Yeah, exactly. Heck or high water. As many before him have said. <laughs> so the, the, uh, the other element of this chapter, or the, the chapter in verse 11, uh, Hebrews 11.1, 11, 1, now faith is. So we, we've talked about the, the, what it, that it's a substance and that hope is attached to it, and that's the, the two work in concert together, but that faith is now. And it, I never really understood that until someone said, it's not saying, now, faith is, and that's how I always read it, as like, you know, it was a common vernacular. They would say, now, you're going to go down the road here and take a left. That's not what it's saying. The words that are in the Bible are not placeholder they're not filler they're not uh just in there for fun there's a reason for it the authors did not have to meet a minimum word limit for their essay this is this is not a ninth grade <laughs> book report yeah. the every word in here is powerful and it's purposeful mm -hmm. and it could change your life even with the small word now that that could change somebody's life mm -hmm. because faith is now if it isn't now then it isn't faith it the, the expectation is, is, should be a now expectation, and that should reflect in your prayer life and in the verbiage that you use. Now, it seems, it seems as though people might think that you're nitpicking or that you're, you know, just being, oh, you're just being too particular about how you say that. No, you, you need to be particular. In the court of, of law, you need to have very particular verbiage to express a certain thing. And there are people out there, there are lawyers out there who are there to find the loopholes in what you said. Well, you didn't fully express all parties involved, and even though the, that addendum wasn't put in there, there's, there's loopholes. And it's not to say that people would want to provide loopholes, but we have an enemy who would provide loopholes. And within those loopholes, he is able to put seeds of doubt. And for anybody who has been a Christian longer than 2.5 seconds, you will know that the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And when he does that, he is coming and he is bringing doubt and he is bringing fear. I mean, that's what Satan did in Genesis 1 is he, he, he came as a, a cunning serpent and he was there to bring doubt and questioning to, the, to what God said. Yea, hath God said. And, and so if you are not speaking steadfastly about your faith, if you are not speaking of it in a now manner, then there is room, there's some wiggle room in there. There's room for, well, we'll, we'll wait and see, you know, we'll, we'll see how, how long, how long it's going to happen, you know, if you're, you're believing for, for healing, you know, it's going to come, but it's just not going to come right now. We're going to, we're going to, keep an eye on it. I had a boss that would, that would say, we're going to keep an eye on it. We'll see how it goes and we'll go from there, which was a lot of words to say, we're going to do nothing about it. And that's exactly what will happen. If that's how you uh, stand in faith for anything, whether it's healing or, or prosperity or even salvation, you can't put uh, an endless time limit on it. You, you know, it's now. Salvation is now. The day of salvation is today. It is now. And to put anything beyond now is shortchanging yourself and leaving a, a, a gaping wide hole for Satan to just come on in and eat your lunch and pop the bag. To borrow a phrase. Yeah. It's said that Jesus is the same 
yesterday, today, and forever. And we have heard people say, yes, Jesus healed people 2,000 years ago, but I haven't heard or seen him heal anybody today. And they may also say, well, when I get to heaven, then I'll be restored. Yeah. Everything will come to me when I'm heaven in the future. Well, the word says Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He healed people by faith. Yeah. People are going to heaven by faith. Jesus is alive and working today by faith. Now faith is not tomorrow, not last week, not next year. Now, if you have something you need and God has an answer for it, he has given you faith and it is active now. Once you put the word to it, you are off and running, so buckle up. And, and those words that you use, they definitely mean something. Think about this, the difference between I can't and I won't. Now, for someone who is learning English as a second language, there are certain words that they'll mess up, and sometimes it's kind of a funny little hiccup, and, and sometimes we're able to figure out what they mean, even though it's not exactly correct. But when you think about just these two phrases, I can't and I won't, they are very similar, but they mean two very different things. I have heard a particular child, not to name any names, but who has the habit of saying, I can't. I need you to go to bed. I can't. I need you to go put your pajamas on. I can't. I need you to do X, Y, Z. I can't. It's not that she can't. It's that she won't. And we've explained this, that it's, it's choosing. But to say I can't means that you physically cannot, but to say you won't is completely different. So the verbiage that you use is is essential to positioning yourself in a place uh, to receive victory in whatever it is that you are battling. And, and there's a certain order to that. For instance, if you were to place uh, an order on Amazon, you know, that's something that many of us do and, or, or any other online retailer. You go online, you type in your order, you pay for it, you click enter, it's got your information and you even get tracking information sent to you in the email. That's all fine and good, but how many of us then turn around and say for the next 24 hours or however long it takes to get to you, oh, I wish I had a whatever you just bought. Oh, I just really wish I had that. You know, I, I mean, I, I'd love to have that. Well, you have it. It just hasn't arrived. There's a certain process. It, it's got to go through shipping and handling and, you know, then, you know, God forbid if the post office gets a hold of it. But, you know, there's certain, there's certain elements that you need to wait for in order to, to get these things. Now, you know, some places ship very quickly. Some places are closer to you, and so shipping might be that day, and shipping might be, you know, three to six business weeks. <laughs> you never know. It's, it's just it varies from time to time. But there's definitely an expectation, and there's also a corresponding action that goes, that goes with that of, you know, resting and waiting for it to arrive. Say you bought a large color TV from an online retailer, one of those big 70-inch plasma TVs. You're trying to order it in time for your favorite football game. You paid for it. You've selected the, the shipping time. When it gets closer to that time, a person who would be anticipating receiving that television would remove the old television, mm -hmm. clear off the table, and make room for the new television to be brought in, sat down, and connected. It a table that big is going to get hung up. Well, some people do have <laughs> credenzas that are that large. <laughs> anyway, a person would make arrangements. They would take corresponding action in anticipation mm -hmm. of delivery. Uh, yeah. The woman who uh, was healed by Jesus with a condition of, of blood, mm -hmm. she had a flow that would not stop. She said within herself, if I could reach out and touch his garment, I'll be made whole. I'll be healed. Mm -hmm. In order to make that happen, her corresponding action was to reach out and touch his garment. Yeah. And from there, the power flowed. Jesus was in a crowd of people with all his disciples. They were thronging him. People were bumping into him all over. They were bumping into the disciples. But when this woman touched him, virtue or power drained out of him, went out of him into her body mm -hmm. and made her whole. And her, 
her flow of blood stopped because she said with her mouth, believed with her heart, and then performed corresponding action, a work, to make that happen. And, and what people in the past have called that a point of contact. That, yeah. that was very famously said by Oral Roberts. You have to have a point of contact, whether it's his yeah. laying off hands. He would, we've heard our family members talk about back in the 50s and 60s, he would reach out his hand to the camera and say, touch my hand on the screen, and that will be your point of contact. What that's doing is getting the person to put an action along with their word and their faith. They hear a word on healing from the Bible. They confess that out loud so that they hear it with their own ears. It goes down into their heart. The heart takes hold of it. Now they have to do something. Many times in healing meetings, people who are seeking healing are encouraged to get up and do something they weren't able to do before. Yeah. If someone has a leg problem, they're encouraged to stand up and move around. If they have a 